Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Welcome to this service of communion this evening. It's lovely to be here and to deputise Paul Scott while he's on a well-deserved holiday. And I invite you to join me in saying the colic for purity. <clears throat> Almighty God, God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known. From you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. We remain standing for our hymn. Mighty God, the fountain of all wisdom, you know our necessities before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Have compassion on our weakness and mercifully give us those things which for our unworthiness we dare not and for our blindness we cannot ask. Through the worthiness of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God. Please will you sit for our first A reading from the book of Genesis. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, and to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you, and will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called that place Bethel, 
but the name of the city was Luz at the first. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks, Thanks. 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 Thanks.
A reading from the letter to the Romans. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children the then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs of with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him, so that we may also be glory, with, glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the, re the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was for the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning with labour pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our body, redemption of our bodies. For in the hope we are saved. Now the hope that is seen, not hope, is not hope. For who hope for who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Hear what the Spirit of is saying with God, God's peace. Thanks, Jesus. Thanks, Jesus. We stand now for our next hymn, which is number 542.
Hear the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord Christ. Jesus put before them another power. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Collect the weeds first, bind them in bundles to be burnt, but gather the wheat into my path. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. And he answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man, the field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone with ears listen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. May I speak in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So I think there's a common thread that joins our readings together. We've had such a rich banquet of biblical text. This evening we've had Genesis 28, we've had Psalm 139, we've had Romans 8, and we've had Matthew 13. Some of the most brilliant, uh, rich passages in the whole of the Bible. And yet the thread that I want to suggest that connects them is not necessarily one you may have thought of yourself. It's the idea that God goes before us. The idea that God has already been wherever we are going. It's the idea which is proper to classical theistic belief that while we need God, God does not need us. While we must do various tasks or challenges, God is not beholden to anybody else to do any sort of task or challenge. Sometimes when you hear people pray, especially in a corporate context like the church, it sounds as though they're giving God a list of things to do and there'll be trouble if God hasn't done them by the end of the next week. Now that may be the reality for many of us, but it is not the reality for God. God's entirely, purely, in himself sufficient is the God that we believe in. And if God wasn't like that, then God wouldn't be God. So Jacob realises, having lain his head foolishly on a stone, so he has a very bad dream about angels going up and down on a sort of escalator, that God has been to that place before him. That is in fact a holy place, regardless of how unpromising it seemed to start with. It is none other than the house of God and the gate of heaven. In Psalm 139, the psalmist realises that God encompasses me behind and before, lays his hands upon you. There is no way of escaping from the presence of God. There is no way in which you can be outside God's love and care. It's a remarkable message. In Romans, Paul is addressing a community who are anxious about when exactly 
the end of the age will come, when exactly the full glory of what was promised in Christ will be revealed. And one of the things that Paul says to them is, well, God is already there. <laughs> yes, there is more to come, but you are the first fruits of the Spirit. You have the first fruits of the Spirit. You are already the children of God. Do not forget it. While you are waiting anxiously for this future that you imagine that binds all things together and makes sense of all things, remember you are children of God to start with. And you bear already the fruits of the Spirit. You share already in Christ, who is the Son of God. You are part of that sonship, brothers and sisters, with Christ. And though you are anxious about the end of the age, God is with you. That is the message of that entire chapter, Romans 8. And then, well, Matthew 13, guess what? A church congregation is anxious again. And in this particular occasion, they are anxious about the fact that while they are wonderful Christians, some of the people around them are awful Christians. What will happen to those people? Why has God allowed that to happen? What's going to be the resolution to the problem of all these awful people around me? And I have to say, I always slightly laugh at this, because every church I've ever known has had a congregation of people where they imagine that there are some terrible people in the congregation, and what are we going to do about the terrible people? When I was a curate, there was a wonderful lady called Margaret who had the greatest anxiety about how awful everybody was in the church. And even now, the memory of this lady makes me want to laugh out loud. I discovered quite soon on that the reason for this is that her husband had been a priest himself, her long departed husband, and it was her long experience of being the wife of the priest that everyone in the church is awful. So what are you going to do about it, Father Graham? And that the answer in St Matthew is, well, you know, you've got to wait for the end of the age. But I want to point to you one thing that the passage takes for granted, which is the gospel does bear fruit. When Jesus talks about seeds in various gospels, it is always the case that they will bear fruit, that there will be wheat, there will be grain that grows up for a harvest for God. And the reason why I want to accentuate that is that very often these days we worry. We look around us at the empty pews or the empty chairs and we think, well, where are the other people coming from? And we are always anxious. Everybody who has ever believed in God and held a hope in God finds themselves anxious because it's the human nature. We who are ourselves not God, constantly striving in some way to make ourselves God, to put ourselves at the centre of the universe. And the whole message that our Creator wants to give us is not to worry about that because God is God at the centre of the universe. We are not and we grow towards him in our greater knowledge of him the more we realise that he, not us, is the centre of the universe. That is what God is saying to us in all our Bible texts today. He goes before us. He is already there. He knows everything before we get to know things. And whilst we may think of life as a matter of gaining or achieving or grasping or learning, all of those things are very human things. The things of God are already achieved. They're already there in God's perfect being. What we ask is through Jesus that we grow to be at one with God. But that at one that atonement, is already done for us. We do not accomplish it ourselves. Now the reason why I want to emphasise all of this is not just because... That is, I think, the common thread through all of these passages, despite all of the anxiety of the poor humans who are trying desperately to work out the truth of their lives. It's also the message of Holy Communion, the Eucharist, that we celebrate this evening. You may sometimes wonder why we have one type of service where we hear all these lovely words, and that's it. And then we have another type of service where we hear all the lovely words, 
And then we do this rather odd thing where we eat something that's bread but not really like bread and we drink something that's wine but not really like wine. Why do we do this very odd thing? Well, it is to remind ourselves that God has gone before us in Jesus Christ. And when we are sharing bread and wine, which is for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ, around this table on an occasion like this, that is what we remember. And it should be, it should be a vast relief. Very rarely do you see this in church. I wish we saw it more often. But everybody goes, oh, not just thank God, hallelujah, but thank God I have been struggling all week to try and be a better person, to try and make myself into something that I, I fear I'm not, to try no longer to be a sinner, to be inadequate, to be unsatisfactory. I've been trying so hard. Thank God that process is at an end now because in this ritual I remember that I am a child of God. I am a member of the body of Christ. And when we remember Christ, torn apart on that cross, when we remember him in this resurrection ritual of bread and wine this evening, then we remember ourselves as well. We are not people who have to worry about being far from God. He is with us. We are not homeless wanderers like Jacob. We are actually all the time in the very house of God and at the very gate of heaven. That is the good news. In the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Now I ask you to stand and say with me the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge our baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now in the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. receives our joys and sorrows. Let us offer our prayers for the church, those in need, and all of creation.
O oh God, you call your church to announce the gospel of reconciliation and truth, both near and far. Guide your church as it seeks your wisdom and shares it, trusting your spirit bearing witness among us. and called it good, direct policy makers to protect lands and seas, bring rain to sun-parched fields and protect areas around the world where there is the impact of natural disasters. Desire peace among nations and peoples, guard our neighborhoods from hatred, watch over our police officers and firefighters, teach us to advocate for those who live in fear. Gracious and merciful, comforting those who suffer any affliction, especially those whose names we lift aloud are in the silence of our hearts. Sustain your people who live with HIV AIDS or any long-term illness. Provide shelter for all those who are unhoused and release any who are unjustly imprisoned. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. You name each of us as your children. Guide our hospitality ministry to welcome all. Inspire us in our search for a ministry of education to equip us for faithful living and open our hearts to find a fruitful social ministry to enact the gospel in our community. You send faithful people to proclaim freedom from bondage and to renew your church. Encourage us by the witness of the faithful departed, so that we may live that same hope. Into your hands, O God, we commend all for whom we pray. In the name of the one who reconciled all creation to himself, Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbour. We say together, have mercy upon us. Most merciful Father, in your compassion forgive us our sins, know and remember them, things done and have done them, and so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honour and glory of your name. upon you the forgiveness that God has already offered and has gone before you with throughout this week. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power
power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. Amen. We are the body of Christ. In one spirit we were all baptised into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. It's so for one another a sign of God's peace. So we sing our arbitrary hymn for the fruits of all creation.
Therefore we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus with prophets, apostles and martyrs, and with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope, to proclaim with them your glory in the unending hymn. So remembering all that was done for us, the cross, the tomb, the resurrection and ascension, longing for Christ's coming in glory, and presenting to you these gifts your earth has formed and human hands have made, we acclaim you, O Christ. Dying, Jesus Christ our death. Rising, we restore our life. Christ Jesus, come our glory. Send your Holy Spirit upon us. Upon these gifts of bread and wine, so they may be to us the body and blood of your Son Jesus Christ. Grant that we, burning with your Spirit's power, may be a people of hope, justice, and love. <coughs> Giver of life, draw us together in the body of Christ, and in the fullness of time, gather us with all your people into the joy of our true eternal home. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ. By the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, we worship you, our God and Creator, in voices of unending praise. Blessed are you now and forever. Amen. So, as our Saviour Jesus Christ has taught us, we are bold.
I think most of us know already the uh, announcements which I will make. Uh, we know that uh, Pfarrerin Theresa Tunbergen from this church uh, will be having, will be leading us at the end of July and will become the uh, Pfarrerin in the Herdekirche. Tomorrow at 10 o'clock in this church, the Evangelische Gemeinde will be um, saying farewell in their service to Theresa Tunbergen. Laurie will be there, I will be there. We have a little presentation for Theresa Tunbergen. As you know, uh, her predecessor, Friedrich Karnich, and also Theresa Tunbergen have always been very helpful to us, have always been very welcoming to us, and have always opened this church to us and cooperated with us. Therefore, if any of you can join the Evangelische Gemeinde tomorrow at 10 o'clock here in this church, Please do so for the farewell from this church, not from Weimar, of Therese Tenberg. The next. Uh, ah. You can find our flyer at the back of the church where you can see that our next service will be on Monday, the 14th of August, in this church, a service of evening prayer, and the next Eucharist will be on Saturday at the on the 22nd, the 26th of August. The flyers are as usual at the back of the church. The collection today, if you wish to donate anything, the basket is at the back of the church. The donation is for St. Michael's Church for the um, defraying of our costs. Thank you. Peace of God, which passes all understanding, give the hearts and minds and the knowledge and love of God, and His Son Jesus Christ our Lord, the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Now, interestingly, in complete contradiction to what I said in my sermon, we're going to sing our last hymn.
During my announcements, I forgot to say, of course, that after the service, there will be cheese and wine up here for a fellowship in the Gemeindehaus, if you wish to join us. That was the most important thing, and I forgot <laughs> it. 